A very good day to you, and it is an unspeakable joy to share with you what I'm going to share with you today. We're looking at Philippians, and I thought before we get into the actual chapter, we have to position the book correctly and also look at the things that are not what are instructions to the believer today, because they are written to the nation of Israel, they're written regarding prophecy, but we understand that we follow the writings by Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul in the pages of the scriptures that begin with his name. So that's what I'm going to do today. But I want to please, I need to, I need to draw attention to this. If you're listening to it, if you're watching it, please share it. It's not a conventional message to what many people believe and think, but they're taking scriptures that are not written for us and they are trying to apply them. And what happens is that they soon lose their faith. They know they have to believe, they will believe, but why didn't God heal their child? Why didn't this happen? Why didn't, and there are many, many what happened. Why didn't that happen? Why is God not doing that? Ask anything in my name and you shall receive it. Is that so? Uh, Okay, have you tried that one? I don't think so. Because along with that verse goes, sell everything and follow me and have no possessions. Now we're going to get to that. Also linked to the Lord's Prayer. Very interesting. But what I want to do is get going with these things. And today I'm going to touch on many aspects, including the opening of the book of Philippians and Paul and how he addresses it. So I hope you're really going to enjoy this as much as what I do. Um, We're dealing with the book of Philippians and it opens with these words. And the key word here is word number one, Paul. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, another interesting expression, which are at Philippi. Now, Philippi was a little town, and Paul is writing to them. And interestingly, as he writes to them, he writes regarding the grace of God and how it works, because he says that to the saints in Jesus Christ, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Now that structure comes out of his writings. It's not a structure that um, exists outside of that because they had apostles and they had other um, positions. But then it goes on and it says, and Paul writes specifically, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to do now is very significant because I'm now going to go into the writing of the books. And can I say, and I can't but express this enough, it is so important that you know specifically what books are written to me and you or to you and me. And if you get it wrong, do you know it's still the word of God? It is still the scriptures, but they have nothing to do with you. And your life is going to miss the will of God And it's also going to miss the understanding of what's expected of you. And I promise you, you will come become disillusioned if you don't see the distinctions here. So very, very critical. And I promise you, you're not going to learn this at a theological college, unless it is a a theological college that believes in rightly dividing the distinction of the message of Paul as a revelation, not prophecy as the other writings are. And also, the dispensing of God's word in a way that his dispensational teaching is the grace of God. So um, I'm going to cover quite a bit of verses here. And what I'm asking is, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, please do not lose the theme and the context of what it is. Now, I can tell you of people who've been in the ministry, done doctorates 28 years, 30 years, And I promise you, when they see what I'm going to share with you today, they are horrified that they never understood it before, despite reading the scriptures so many times. But may I also say that pastors, theologians, and even reverends are more covering what people that are current topical writers are saying about how God is working and not getting to the core of the scriptures. You cannot afford to do that. Why not? Well, it's pretty simple. 
you've got children and they hang in the balance of an eternal destiny with destiny with God or an eternal destiny in the, on the basis of hell. God has put words in the scriptures that are never given the credit they should be, but also the versions. In the King James Version, King James Bible, the only one in the English language that is preserved from the manuscripts originally, and the preservation is as important if not more so than the inspiration. Everybody claims the inspiration, picks up a Bible and says, well, it was accurate in the original manuscripts. So God didn't preserve it. So what are you holding in your hand? Forgive me. I'm going to be straight because I'm fearful of not giving this to you. And I promise you, it revolutionizes your faith. And the whole Bible is rich and blessed to you. But you know what is written to you. It's like... Um, the reality of just understanding something that doesn't put you into the expectation and the feeling that if something doesn't work, maybe there's sin in your life. Don't ever, ever, ever buy into that, please. And you know what? I'm an open book. You can, if you can make an appointment, visit me and you want to argue with me. I love that. I literally love it because you know what? I see things from a different angle and then I think, well, what is the scripture actually saying on that topic? And I promise you, what I discover reinforces Paul's message being a revelation that is distinct. I wrote on a comment on Facebook this morning. And that comment, what I said was that, do you know that other faiths and what they call uh, mono uh, theological faiths or mono monodiastic uh, faiths, meaning they only believe in one God, not multiple gods. Do you know there are two of them? The one is the, 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 the Muslim faith and the other is the Jewish faith. And do you know that both of those faiths in their highest order of imams and priests and rabbis say that there was something wrong with Paul because he dismantled their law-based Old Testament faith and replaced it with a new message. Yes, he did. Gospel of grace. And that's what you've got to hope. Let's have a look at some more things here. I honestly cannot tell you how powerfully beautiful this is. So I want to just um, start out by saying that an overview of the New Testament is more imperative than a knowledge of the detail. Um, I can't stress that enough, but I'm telling you, you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the verses, and the books, and the whatever you, and the stuff that's not written to you, you're going to be horrified. And the Bible starts in Matthew 1, 1 as the New Testament. Hebrews 9 explains that's not the New Testament or covenant, because it only begins when Jesus dies, and that's still for the Jews. Um, and as I say, if you don't understand what I'm saying, and you're not with me, I promise you I will dedicate endless time to sharing with you. But I promise you, and I was with a man, Alan, last week, and I was chatting about this. And he said, but I've been a Christian 30 years. I've never seen this. But in my faith, I would have highs and lows, and then I would kind of not know what God was doing. And then he, I said to him, and I said this, and I say it to you, if you get this right, then let me assure you, I will guarantee you, and I mean it in all sincerity, I will guarantee you that in actual fact, you are going to, um, you are going to find something that is workable. That's not based on your faith for God to respond. It's based on the simple trust that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. First Corinthians 15, one to four, three and four particularly, that's all there is. And then just allowing God's honor in your life to bring the fruit of peace and joy and grace and mercy and kindness and how he works. And there's some beautiful verses on that I can't go to, but I cannot stress this enough. And sorry if I've actually um, drawn it out a bit, but I'm also inspired by the conversations I have. And I'm going to touch on some of those, but I hope that you're with me on this. 
And please don't ignore it. We've got 50,000 things going on. We've got the fear of COVID resurgence. We've got a fear of, of economic implications, especially in South Africa. We have numerous things that can occupy your mind. But if you don't put it on the word of God, you're never going to find that peace that passes understanding that Paul speaks of. So let's get stuck into this. Okay, what I want to look at here is something very important, and that is that the overview of the New Testament is going to answer what is written to you and what is not. Now, here's the order of the books. I've put these in the order of the New Testament books, and the ones I've listed in blue in the beginning of Acts is written for the Jews in the nation of Israel at the time of Christ and the prospect of a kingdom being established on earth there and then following the tribulation into the thousand years peace. That was 2,000 years ago, and then the new heaven and the new earth. But in Acts, when Stephen is stoned in chapter 8 and he gives his address, God then saves Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul the apostle, and reveals a new message no longer faced at the Israel nation alone but written to every individual, not to become part of a nation, but to become part of the body of Christ. So this overview is critical. And I want to say to you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the first eight chapters of Acts, if you read an instruction in there, celebrate it, but know it's not written to you. Can I say that again? Celebrate it. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written to the Jews. Now listen to what Luke 16, 16 says on that. It says the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is established. No, it doesn't say established. Is it introduced? No, it's not. The kingdom of God is preached. In other words, the law and the prophets spoke about a prophecy where Jesus Christ would be the Messiah and that he would in fact be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that is why Matthew 1.1 lists Abraham and David, because Abraham and David, David was the highest level of king that the nation of Israel ever thought they had, even to this day, I believe. But you know what? Why Abraham? Because David was a king of Israel. And in the Old Testament, there was a prophecy that the King of Kings would arrive and he would be the king of the nation of Israel until they became the kingdom of God as a nation and they would take it to the rest of the nation. So let me just say that again. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. What did John do? Started out preaching the gospel. What did he do? He brought a message, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, 2000 years on, that's not like it's very at hand. And there's some other verses covering that. But again, forgive me if I move through this, but I really can't tell you how important it is. Okay, so let's just refresh. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts 1 to 8 is dealing with the nation of Israel that if they were saved and they believed and became the little flock, then from that, God would then send them out to the rest of the world in what is known, and maybe you want to guess it, what is known as the Great Commission. Does that have to do with us? Nope, it don't. And no, it doesn't. And if you think the Great Commission was written for you, I promise you, you're not going to make sense of the scriptures the way that you should. Okay, then Acts chapter 9, what happens is there's a turning point, And that is that after Stephen is stoned, he is put to death, he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. I, uh, there's something significant about that that I won't pick up on. But Acts chapter 9 is the saving and the conversion of Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. Now, the day that he was saved, did he know what his message that God was going to give him was going to be? No, no. He had it revealed to him over a period of time. But as that happened, and you can read chapter 9, it'll tell you that he went, um, he went, he lost his sight for a few days. He was blinded, but he got his sight back. God began to reveal this truth to him, and on he went in teaching and preaching what we know as the gospel of grace. Anyway, 
Let me just read this. It says, Paul's revelation of grace without works from Jesus Christ for us today, the body of Christ. When Peter preached before Acts chapter 9, when Jesus preached before chapter 9, and when John preached before chapter 9, where Saul is saved, all three of them had a message, and that was repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The repentance and the baptism were signs that they had faith. We do not need signs. We need personal trust in Christ dying for our sins and rising again. So let me just go through these. These are, these are the books that apply to us. Number one, chapter Acts chapter 9 to 28 is the record which records what they call the Acts of the Apostles, including the old apostles and Paul the Apostle, and how he has to educate them to this new message that they didn't want to know, and he had to actually explain to them. But then there are the books, they're not in chronological order, but they're in a beautiful significance of doctrine. Then there is three aspects to it. God gave his word for doctrine, for reproof, which is actually pointing out error, and for correction, which is what happens when you've not being as accurate as you should be. Remember Paul, I can also say to you uh, that Paul was in actual fact very much dealing with some of the things that are what we deal with. He was dealing with people who were founded in Jesus' teaching. They were the little flock. They were waiting for Jesus to return and establish this kingdom. And you know that all of them, to fulfill what God had said through Jesus to them, had to sell everything. And follow Jesus. Now, that's a lovely subject and topic. But I'm telling you, if a pastor doesn't do that and he still preaches from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm afraid he ain't in the word of God. And my question is not critical of them. My take is this. What is he going to say to God when God says, but my dear pastor friend, can you not read English? I thought you were English. I thought you were whatever language. But if you can read, you would know that the nation of Israel never responded. They stoned Stephen. And I decided to interrupt my prophecy program of the Old Testament, which was prophesied, including the tribulation, which now lies ahead of us. But I decided to save Saul of Tarsus, make him Paul the Apostle. And from that, I began to reveal a new message that you didn't have to be a Jew. You didn't need to be of any form of nation, but you could be Jew or Gentile, male, female, bond, slave, but it was individual, not dealing with the nation of Israel anymore, not dealing with any other nation. That's why it doesn't say, okay, we'll turn from the Jews and the nation of Israel and go unto just this nation. It was open to the sinner to accept the Savior because he died for our sins. Again, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. But what I'm saying, if you don't understand this, I promise you, you're going to be sorrowful when you get to the end of life and you have not taught your children and your grandchildren and your wife and your spouse the truth. Now, I'm prepared to discuss and debate this at any level because it's in and founded on the word of God. And when I deal with people, as I say, 30 years, 50 years, some of them, they discover what the Bible has said all along and they become angry and they say, why did my theological college not teach me this? Why did my professor not teach me this? I've got a very good friend, Gavin. You know that his daughter went to a professor of a denomination because she was searching and she couldn't find answers with contradictions that the Bible has between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which was kingdom-based, to Paul's writings. And you know, she went and she asked him questions, genuinely searching. And you know what this professor said to her? He said, don't question me. And he became arrogant and full of nonsense. You know why? Because professor doesn't mean you know the truth. No, it doesn't. In fact, the higher your level of qualification in being a doctor or being a professor or being a priest or a pastor or whatever, the title or reverend this, the title makes people trust you. And that's the wrong reason to trust. Search the scriptures. Read Acts 17, 10 and 11. Paul writes and he says, 
and I, I think it's it's well worth reading. I I absolutely love it, but it's so much more profound than just a verse being quoted. Um, it's key to whether you're going to walk the walk of the Lord or walk a walk you think is the Lord's and be out of the way. Now I'm going to say something here, and please add listen to what I'm saying here. Is there a God and is there Satan? Yes, there is. Too many Christians are chasing Satan these days, thinking that they've got to name and claim and cast out demons. And that doesn't exist. I promise you that doesn't exist. However, do you know that if Satan could really fool you and he couldn't hide the truth, so you believe Jesus died for your sins, he was buried and he rose again and you become saved, do you know what he wants to do? He wants to paralyze your walk so that you can't serve God well. And I get this hundreds of times. And I'll begin to explain something and people say, wow, that makes some sense. It's in the Bible. Yeah. And then they'll tell me that their kids have questions and they can't answer them. Let me tell you, you might be a, 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 a chartered accountant and your kid's doing it the subject of economics at school. You can answer every question. But if you can't answer about salvation, my friend, it doesn't matter what you do, whether you're a medical doctor, a professor, um, a scientist, that's not relevant to the saving of a person's soul, which requires to know which books detail how to be saved. And those are Paul's books in the times that we live in. I hope I'm making sense. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just saying, this is not a subject you ignore. If you think you saved, well, what were you saved from? A lost eternity? Hell? Torment for billions of years? Well, why is there not such an importance for your children to be saved? And you know what? If you're saved and you share the same message, young people go to universities, they go to the wisdom of the world in the people that are recognized as being the professors. All sorts of titles. And you know what? That's the wisdom of the world. It's not the wisdom of God. Read 1 Corinthians 1 from verse 20. 21 onwards, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, you know, I must tell you that um, what we're looking at, these are Paul's revelation of grace without works, where it's not works. And if you want to read anything, take Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4 and see about works. There's not a single thing you and I have to do. Christ did it all. We don't even have to show it by an illustration including, and boy, people get wound up about this one, including baptism. People say, well, I have to get have baptized because it's an outer showing of an inner happening. Now, let me tell you, behind your front door, if you're not showing change, forget about the baptism. You're a pretty nice person in front of the Christians on a normal Sunday anyway. But boy, your family know that you haven't actually understood the saving grace of God and it hasn't changed your heart and mind and given you the new mind of Christ. So Romans chapter 3 and 4 and 7, Paul deals with the falling away of the law, that it's not the law, which was what Jesus announced in the verses I read there, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is being preached. Was there something different coming? Of course there was. Otherwise, the Lord would not have inspired these words in the Bible. And every man presses into it. In other words, the kingdom of God, men would go into that, not by the law and the prophets or the sacrifices, but by the life of Christ as the sacrifice. That would have still been given for salvation, but not like we have it today. So Paul's books are Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and lastly, Philemon. Now, for the sake of memory, most people know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, Acts of the Apostles. But if you want to remember these verses, you start roaming in Paul's verses. So that's why <laughs> where Romans comes from. Then you've got 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, which way do they go? Because, boy, they can, you can battle to remember which way they are. And look at the letters here. G, E, P, and C are the letters that actually deal with 
these books that are beautiful. Ephesians is a book of doctrine. Romans is a book of doctrine. And of course, the book of Thessalonians is doctrine as well about the end times for us, not the end times for the nation of Israel and the tribulation and revelation. Revelation has got nothing to do with us. Now, I've probably hit a nail on the head, but I'm telling you that it doesn't have anything to do with it because it's the focus of God on the nation of Israel again. And the seven churches in the book of Revelation are the seven churches that will be established and exist that are not Christian body of Christ churches. Okay, for those of you who, who've studied that, you're probably going to wonder what I'm saying, but I promise you the Bible is crystal clear on it. Then, G-E-P-C. So which way do those go? Now, a Gentile is a non-Jew. Were Jews allowed to eat pork? Pork sausages, bacon? No, they weren't. But the Gentiles, and look at this, the Gentiles eat pork chops. So you remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And then what happens after that? You go into all the T's. In other words, First and Second Thessalonians, that's a T. And Thessalonians comes first. It's the longest one first, the shorter one second, and the smallest one third. So it's a decline, it's a downwinding of the names in length as Paul begins to wind up his books that are in the Bible that way. And then Philemon is the last one. And Philemon's a very interesting book because it doesn't have chapters. It's just one chapter as such. It's just one letter with no chapters, but it does have verses. I don't know if that'll help you remember, but I hope so. So Acts chapter 9 to 28 is actually the coverage of the acts of what happened as these books were being re revealed to Paul and as he was discussing it with the men who should have been teaching him if it was the same message as the 12 apostles, why does he have an issue with them? Why do they not understand that in actual fact, he has to, what he calls, he withstood Peter to the face. In other words, he went to Peter and he said, Peter, I've taught you that the Jews are no longer the nation God is dealing with, and they are no longer superior because they rejected Christ. But God will deal with them in the tribulation and turn them back with a rod of iron, not with an offer of a kingdom like he did when he dealt with them. Oh, I've covered some stuff here, but I, you know what? I get into discussions with people I've known a long time, and I promise you it is scary how little people know. And what I'm talking about, is not a mountain of knowledge, simple principles. I've shared it in half an hour. Well, I think it is. Um, <laughs> I didn't put my time on, so this may be longer. But you know what? I'm burdened by the fact that people need to know this because it makes your Christian walk alive. And this man that I spoke to, 30 years a Christian, he said his faith had wobbled when he first became a Christian, then he faded away and lost his faith and whatever. It's quite simple. You can't keep what you told if you told out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John what you've got to do because it wasn't for you. So what happens? You become disillusioned. You become depressed. You think your faith is lacking. Maybe there's sin in your life. Absolute nonsense because in Christ, Holy Spirit dwells within. We are seen as being in Christ and we are seen as righteous by God. But the excitement about seeing this distinction ignites an interest. And you know what I said to him? I said, I guarantee you, Alan, when you start to discover this, your faith won't drop and wobble because it works together so well that you are so enthusiastic that instead of having to share the gospel, now you can't keep quiet because you're saying, wow, look how beautiful grace is. And you know, grace is not trying to keep the Ten Commandments and grace is not trying to do those things. They perfect the Ten Commandments, but they were laws given that man couldn't keep to make him guilty so he would understand that he needed God's resurrection and death and burial, etc. So I hope you're with me in what I'm saying. Um, and remember, if you live in the Eastern Cape, I promise you there's nowhere too far for me to come and spend some hours, go through the scriptures and discuss this. Mm -hmm.